So I want to start by talking a little bit about my son, Lewis, who died following elective surgery at a teaching hospital at the age of 15. Lewis was one of the top students in South Carolina. He was a soccer player. He was a musician, an actor. He was a natural comedian. I always feel as though I have to start out talking about him because this is what it is about. It's about him. It's about the patients who suffer because of the deficiencies in our system. Lewis was athletic. He was absolutely healthy. His father and I thought that we were just the luckiest parents in the world. We thought we were raising the consummate man of the 21st century. But when he, Lewis had just turned 15, we took him to the hospital for minimally invasive surgery, repair of pectus excavatum, defect of the chest. The pain regimen following his surgery included the IV NSAID Ketorolac. Because we blame this drug for a lot of what happened, I just want to add that even though it is widely used in American hospitals, it was never approved in most of Europe, and it's severely restricted in most other countries. Um, and it's implicated in a surprising number of the cases that I hear of as an advocate for medical error victims. But briefly, the short story of what happened when we were in the hospital was that Lewis was prescribed a full adult course of the drug Ketorolac by a young senior resident who was following a written protocol and didn't realize the significance of the fact that Lewis wasn't appreciating, wasn't producing urine. His orders for IV fluids were also inadequate. He was apparently following the guidelines for a much younger child. It took two days of struggling with a disjointed parade of residents and nurses to get his, his orders changed and his IV fluids increased to an appropriate level. And by that time, apparently the damage had been done. Lewis died four days after surgery from an, an NSAID-induced giant duodenal ulcer. His death was preceded by over 30 hours of alarming clinical decline, including more than 24 hours with virtually no urine output and four hours of completely undetectable blood pressure. It was the weekend. None of the young nurses or residents in the hospital had any comprehension of the severity of Lewis's condition. To a person, they were convinced that his various abnormal vital signs were the result of malfunctioning equipment. On the morning of his death, they spent two and a quarter hours scouring the hospital for a blood pressure cuff to detect his undetectable blood pressure. In all, they took his blood pressure 12 times using seven different machines and cuffs. When he suddenly went into cardiac arrest, they were astonished. The resuscitation attempt was delayed, chaotic, and probably mercifully unsuccessful. Even at that juncture, no one thought to open up the spigot on the fluids. In Lewis's chart, when we got it later, we found a plan of care. The plan essentially was that Lewis would get better and go home. I was struck as I had been in the hospital by the fact that there appeared to be no accommodation for any deviation from the optimum. There was simply no plan for dealing with the complication and consequently, it appeared that his symptoms had been downgraded in severity and reinterpreted to fit the preconception. The attending physician, whom we had repeatedly requested, had never been called. The rescue plan we had thought was about to swing into action at any minute had never even entered the minds of our son's young caregivers. 
The bottom line was that they didn't know what to do with a deteriorating patient or apparently how to recognize even the signs of shock. As you can perhaps imagine, I spent months and years pondering circumstances that took our boy from robust health to death in four days. In Lewis's case, we always felt strongly that the primary culprit was the fragmentation and unresponsiveness of the resident care system. But it was also a nursing failure. At any point, I find it hard to imagine that this disaster could not have been averted by a vigilant, assertive nurse. Out of our entire hospital experience, the one person I cannot bring myself to forgive is a self-important nurse who artfully thwarted my attempts to reach the attending for reasons that are still unclear to me. At the same time, one of the few people who really helped us during this hospital stay was a knowledgeable nurse who was the person who managed to get the orders for Lewis's post-operative fluids increased after days of inaction by everybody else. But unfortunately for us, she came onto the scene a little too late. 